approximately two o'clock. Um, and I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, our dear friend Florian. And Florian will speak from uh, island of Oahu, which is Hawaii. And uh, Florian is serving for decades uh, as uh, vice uh, chairman of uh, Hawaiian Anthroposophical Society. He is also founder of Kahumana Community, Kahumana Farm and Community, located also on Oahu, Hawaii, about 40 minutes from Honolulu, to drive maybe even less. And, um, <clears throat> and he's, he's a presenter and speaker for uh, anthroposophical topics and uh, offering presentation and workshops and um, on various uh, uh, anthroposophical and scientific themes. So over 30 years of experience in the design and building uh, of organic architecture and married to Cindy Saito, who is a Waldorf teacher, and he is father, father of three of three uh, Waldorf graduates. So dear Florian, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you're ready, it's over. Yes, it's a, a privilege to uh, give an offering <clears throat> on Easter, and I want to uh, reach out uh, with the spirit of aloha from Hawaii. There's uh, the tourist version, and then there's the more authentic, uh, deeper levels that go back to uh, the peoples who first uh, found these islands uh, with uh, a great deal of adventurous uh, um, sailing with uh, very primitive uh, vessels uh, compared to what we're used to these days. And I think even though Hawaii is a part of the United States politically, uh, geographically, in terms of etheric geography, it's a very different part of the world. And we happen to be between East and West here. And it's really uh, a place that Rudolf Steiner predicted would become the center, the Pacific region, the center mm -hmm. of the emergence of a new world culture. And uh, there is kind of a history that goes back to the Lemurian times, the Atlantean times, uh, where you had, uh, especially in the uh, Lemurian times, where you had a lot more volcanism and uh, the ring of fire is seen as a wound from cataclysms that took place in uh, more ancient times. So Hawaii is a sort of a gathering place potentially for people around the Pacific Rim who represent many different cultures and nations and peoples. And I think that's one of the big challenges of our time is to uh, build bridges between different cultures and cultivate a new form of community that isn't based on blood, uh, which is a given by heredity, etc. And I think uh, in the future, there are opportunities to invite people to, to meet here from around the Pacific uh, to work in that direction. So let me share my screen here. Is that working, Andre? Yeah, it's great, thank you. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted to revisit mm -hmm. uh, something I mentioned in the introductory. Uh, this has to do with the spiritual science as a grail science. The hidden knowledge that flows, although quite unnoticed, 
at the beginning into the mode of thinking of the men of this period, it is only self-evident that up to the present, intellectual forces reject this knowledge. But what must happen will happen in spite of all temporary rejection, the hidden knowledge which from this side takes hold of mankind now and will take hold of it more and more in the future may be called symbolically mm. the wisdom of the grail. If this symbol, as it is given in legend and myth, is understood in its deeper meaning, we shall find that it is a significant image of the nature of what has been spoken of above as a knowledge of the new initiation <laughs> with the Christ mystery at its center. The modern initiates may therefore also be called initiates of the grail. This is from Rudolf Steiner's Occult Science and Outline. The way into the supersensible world, the first stages of which have been described in this book, leads to the science of the grail. To the degree to which the development of mankind will absorb the knowledge of the grail, the impulse given through the Christ event can become ever more significant. To the external aspect of Christian development, the inner aspect will be joined more and more. What may be known through imagination, inspiration, and intuition about the higher worlds in connection with the Christ mystery will increasingly permeate the thought, feeling, and will life of humanity. The concealed knowledge of the grail will be revealed as an inner force it will permeate more and more the manifestations of human life. The cosmology that's outlined in the book that I just quoted from gives this larger sequence of human evolution that starts with the old Saturn where the physical body foundation was laid to old sun where the etheric body foundations were laid to the old moon where the astral body and in each of these certain hierarchical beings on old Saturn it was the thrones on old sun, it was the curiosities on old moon, the dunamis. So now we come to the earth, the fourth stage, which is the middle of a sevenfold sequence. So seven is the number that rules time and the rhythms of evolution that come to expression in time. So one can, when one looks at this evolutionary pattern uh, know that there's a relationship between the first and the seventh, the future Vulcan, as a relationship to the old Saturn, where spirit man, the physical transformation of the body into a temple will take place. Old sun uh, stands across here uh, from the future Venus, where the life spirit, which is where the etheric is raised to a new level. Generally what happens when we die, the etheric body expands, which contains our memories into a great tableau of our earthly life. And then it is uh, expanded out into the cosmic ether. But this future booty or life spirit stage is one where the ether body doesn't uh, uh, leave us, but that we can then between incarnations have this uh, body. And uh, that's a big step forward that is waiting uh, for the future. And then the old moon has a relationship to the future Jupiter condition, the spirit self. In the book of Revelation, it's, it's called the uh, New Jerusalem, the golden city. This is the future sun earth, where the earth becomes reunited with the sun. But that possibility uh, really was given through the mystery of Golgotha, which is the turning point of time, which is what Easter is really all about. And this doesn't just have 
importance for the earth, but through that sacrificial deed, not so much a teaching uh, is in the foreground with Christianity, but it's the deed, the deed of going through uh, this uh, death and overcoming it. This is the sun spirit, the solar logos that's involved. And the gift that was bestowed on humanity is this golden triangle, as it's called in esoteric circles, esoteric Christianity. And it has to do with these three future stages. So those were prefigured by the Jesus Christ being and makes it possible for each and every one of us to unfold these future potentials, which will begin uh, as a part of our evolution already within the earthly uh, stages, which also are sevenfold. And again, the seven stages of the earth are divided into seven smaller stages. But this fourth stage leading over to the fifth is the critical one because it's the human ego that's involved. And this sacrifice was enacted by the Elohim or the spirits of form. Seven of these Elohim uh, played a significant part in the development of our earth. Six of them departed during uh, the recapitulation of the old sun during the earth period. There's always recapitulations. That's the Hyperborean uh, stage of the earth because they needed a more rapid evolutionary development. And one of them remained behind on the earth which in the Lemurian time still uh, contained the moon as well. Later, Yahweh would remove the moon from the earth in order to create a balance. But Yahweh then was having the task of preparing the physical body for the future incarnation of the solar logos, the Christ, which is the six Elohim, together who are agents of the sun principle of the Trinity. The Trinity itself is above and beyond the ninefold hierarchies that serve it. The Christ impulse then gives the ego, which has a lower and a higher aspect. All of the various secrets of initiation have to do with unfolding this higher self. But a part of humanity will fail to embrace this new Christ impulse. And that leads to what's referred to as the eighth sphere. That's, I won't go much into that uh, today, but, uh, it's a real critical period that lies ahead. And humanity is currently going through a threshold experience that started in the 1840s and it will continue into the future. And it involves a dividing of the spirits, those that are on upward evolution and those who are on a downward. So this is sort of the tragic nature of our time. In 1907, at the Munich Congress, which uh, Rudolf Steiner was able to choreograph, was held in Germany. He was the uh, president or chairman of the Theosophical Society uh, since uh, 1902. And together with Marie Steiner had uh, been working in a collaborative way and the society had been growing 
And so here was an opportunity now for him to uh, embellish the hall with artistic expressions, which was an important part of Rudolf Steiner's uh, orientation and mission, so to speak, is to reunite science, art, and religion, which had separated in the past. There was a time when they were in union, like in the Greek time, for example, there was a much more of a bridging between these three. So in that hall, he had then seven seals. And this is the last of those seals, the seventh seal. They're often referred to as Rosicrucian seals or also apocalyptic seals because much of what is in them is uh, expressed through these seals. And there is actually a way of reading the book of Revelation together with meditating on these seven seals uh, in connection with the seven days of the week. So that uh, you begin with the Saturn seal. It's like an evolutionary pattern. And uh, this would then be the uh, Friday seal. And on the left, you have the Gutianum, which was really a modern day grail temple of sorts. And up on the right at the top, you have Solomon's temple, which was entered through a uh, little forecourt which had two great pillars, Yachim and Boaz, that represented the birth mysteries and the death mysteries. And you would enter into the great middle section where the altar of incense was, the seven branch candelabra which represented the planetary spheres, the 12 showbread, the zodiacal forces, and incense is the expression of prayer, the mood of prayer and devotion and reverence and awe and wonder. And then there was the Holy of Holies, which was entered through a curtain with four colors that represented the four elements of earth, air, water, and fire. And within that Holy of Holies, where the high priest uh, would enter once a year to utter the name of the hidden God, which is really the I am, the I am. And there was gold on the walls. There was the cherubim hovering over the Ark of the Covenant with wings spread out to the ends of the walls. And at the mystery of Golgotha, that veil to this room was torn and rent from top to bottom. Connection with the earthquakes and the darkening of the earth in the midday for several hours. So this golden room is cubical and represents the future, the new Jerusalem, which is a cube in its measurements. The cube, which I'm showing down at the bottom right, can be unfolded into a cross. It represents the world of three dimensions of space, the element of earth, and the salt crystal forms in a cubical form. And in the alchemical trinity of salt, mercury, sulfur, salt represents thinking, thinking that can be raised to a higher level, just like salt can dissolve in liquid. So in that seal at the bottom, you have a cube and it's the cube before anything 
arose within the physical world, but it had the potential for everything that came later to arise. And this creation within space by the father aspect of the divinity that's expressed in the ex deo nasimor that's in letters described around this seal. Cooperates with the Luciferic beings represented by the serpents. And then the redemption of the serpents is then expressed in the world spiral, spiral, the evolutionary spiral that the Christ engenders in Christo Murimor, that raises creation to this higher level that comes to expression in the dove, the Holy Spirit, per spiritum sanctum revivissimus. And there is the chalice waiting. It's an inverted chalice because it's the chalice of the heavens waiting to receive what human beings have to offer. There's the old verse that Steiner gave of the stars once spoke to human beings and they're silent now. It's world destiny. But there's a waiting for the future when human beings will speak to the stars. And this is an expression of that, uh, the mystery of the word, the lost word of the Freemasons. The grail sword is the word sword. It's the micro logos mysteries that were bestowed on humanity through the mystery of Golgotha. So there's a great deal in these seals that can be studied and meditated upon in connection with the book of Revelation which was written by one of the great representatives of esoteric Christianity, uh, John, the beloved disciple, who according to Steiner had later incarnated as Christian Rosenkreuz in several incarnations, and Le Comte de Saint Germain in a later incarnation. So the following excerpts from an esoteric conversation between Rudolf Steiner and the Countess Johannes Kaiserling that took place after the agricultural course held in Koberwitz, 1924. This was during the Pentecost season. And you could say this is Rudolf Steiner's last Pentecost uh, season. She asks, and this was, uh, she was someone who was clairvoyant. Rudolf Steiner indicated that she had the faculties that would unfold more in the future. This uh, dawning that we're in right now of a new faculty of imaginative consciousness that's really made possible through the second coming of Christ in the etheric world. And this was the 28th conversation, esoteric conversation she had had Rudolf Steiner with him. And she would do her own research and then she would end up with certain questions. And this involves then the 28th, which is the moon rhythm. You could say she was a moon initiate who created this moon vessel, grail vessel into which the Rudolf Steiner could bestow sun gifts. There's much more in this conversation. I'm just giving one little excerpt here. She asks, can one then believe that the Grail Castle is really present in the etheric world? Travelers in the spiritual world are forever telling us about it. Rudolf Steiner, yes, it is really present. As she then goes on, the grail story, the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreuz and the Mithras cult are all aware of the ca this castle. Is it the same sacred building that in the Bible is called the New Jerusalem? Rudolf Steiner, the New Jerusalem of which the Bible speaks is the eternal archetypal image of how it will be in the future. The grail castle is the image of how it is now 
in the spiritual world. So when we consider the building of the old Gurtianam as a grail temple of sorts, then we can keep this in mind that it is an uh, impulse that's on the way to building the new Jerusalem, which is something we have to co-create. It's not going to happen by itself. This was uh, a painting intended for the original building that was uh, intended for Munich. And because the building authorities were making it particularly difficult to get the permission to build, they eventually withdrew, even though they'd already purchased the land, etc. And a new piece of land was offered in Dornach, Switzerland. And so this painting was intended for there. But uh, Eventually, it ended up in a Waldorf school in Hamburg, Germany. And during the bombing of that city, it was destroyed. This was a huge painting and work of art that took a considerable time by Anna May, who worked on it, you could say, in collaboration with Rudolf Steiner, not only with what Rudolf Steiner gave outwardly, but she had the experience of getting help inwardly with the painting in an in inspirational form. She had a lot of duties during the day. She would paint into the night. And she refers to it as an unforgettable period. So Rudolf Steiner speaks of time as having two currents. One is the etheric current that moves from the past into the present towards the future. And the other is the astral stream that moves from the future into the present. And they converge then in the present. So this painting has that theme within it. The future for us is on the right side, the per spiritum sanctum revivissimus. The past, certain archetypal images and developments of evolution, evolutionary themes are there on the left side. So at the bottom, on the left and right, you have Moses on the left. You have Saul who became Paul on the right. Moses is looking back at the burning bush kind of overwhelmed by his vision. And there's a pillar. There's one, two, three, four main pillars here. And these are the pillars of the archai, which reach and rule over time, periods of 2,160 years, which is one twelfth of the Platonic year. So each time there's one zodiacal influence that comes into play. So on the far left, you have a pillar where Melchizedek is at the top of the pillar under the archai, you could say, under the wings of the archai. And then you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, from whom the 12 tribes arise. And this is then where the Yahweh impulse is particularly at work. The Elohim who remain behind, who works through the blood of the Hebrew people to prepare the grail vessel for the Messiah that was prophetically anticipated. 
And above in the middle of that window, you have King Solomon sitting on his throne. You have the Queen of Sheba in the middle in blue. And you have Hiram on the right, Hiram Abiff, who was the builder of the Temple of Solomon. Solomon, who is of the Abel stream, had inspirations for the temple, which had already been prepared by his father, David, King David. And above you have the Ark of the Covenant hovering and you have the 12 signs of the Zodiac that are sort of received by the Queen of Sheba into this flowering above her head. This is the same individuality who would later become the Solomon Mary at the turning point of time. And Hiram on the right will become Lazarus John, who is raised from the dead, the first Christian initiate. And Solomon's temple uh, was an important contribution. It was like a forerunner of the mystery of Golgotha. It embodied certain secrets that the Templars, the Freemasons, which went back to Egyptian mystery wisdom that was inherited by the Jewish people through Moses, who had been as a child taken up by a princess of the Egyptian people and brought the Osiris mysteries, which were waning into the Hebrew temple mysteries. And in the middle, you have then the image of the mystery of Golgotha renewing the tree of life. In it, there's a fruit of this great sacrifice, which is has a seven-pointed star pentagram within a pentagon, within a circle. These are the proportions, according to Rudolf Steiner, in Wonders of the World, he mentions this, of the fourfold nature of the human being. Inside of the pentagram is a pentagon that relates to the physical body, the pentagram to the etheric, the, the pentagon around the pentagram to the astral, and the ego is the circle that encompasses them all. And at the very top middle, you have the symbol of the Trinity, the triangle that reaches to the left, passes through the Ark of the Covenant, through the head of the Buddha, who's at the top of the pillar on the left of the middle, and to the chalice that's being held by Melchizedek, who represents the sun mysteries that overlight the moon mysteries that Abraham uh, helps to bring into the Hebrew culture and civilization. So there's a tremendous amount in this picture. You have Ju Joseph of Arimathea down below capturing the blood which overflows into the earth. And beneath the earth, you have the three mothers who represent the heritage of the old Saturn, old sun, old moon stages because this is what will transform the earth into a future sun, into the golden city, into the new Jerusalem. And on the pillar of the archai, on the right side, you have the being of the beloved disciple John, and beneath him, an initiate with his eyes open, looking at the mystery of Golgotha. Opposite, under the Buddha, you have an initiate with eyes closed. So it's a more of an inward perception. Whereas in the case of John, it he was beneath the cross. It took place within time and space. 
And there you have Paul looking into the future. He anticipates our own time with the second coming. He considers his gift that was given on the road to Damascus as a preview of the future, the second coming, which is part of our topic. And there in the third triptych panel, you have the initiation of Christian Rosenkreutz within a kind of crystal sarcophagus. And above you have the dove of the Holy Spirit hovering over. And the archai are reaching across these different ages to each other in cooperative endeavor. And you have the archangels who have flames rising out of their heads. You have the angels shown as heads with wings. And around Christian Rosenkreutz, you have then these 12 individualities. And we don't have time to go into that here, but the Rose Cross initiation is expressed beneath that scene in those seven roses. And uh, at the bottom of both the far left and far right, you have stages of initiation that were part of the ancient Hebrew that led to a communion with Abraham, etc. Here on the right, it leads to the very far right pillar where you have the archangel Michael with a dragon beneath his feet and you have the woman standing on the moon crowned with stars and clothed with the sun, which is the woman who gives birth to the cosmic Christ. That's an image of the second coming. So there's a great deal in these kinds of pictures and imaginations, which you could say Rudolf Steiner worked with these themes and brought them together with the help of Anna May. So Melchizedek was highlighted on the far left there and it represent these pre-Christian sun mysteries. According to esoteric Christianity, this being of Melchizedek is the same being that is referred to as the Manu in the Eastern tradition. He's the 13th in the Lodge of the Twelve. And this particular Manu is one who has divine origins. His incarnations didn't just begin with uh, the first incarnations in Lemurian times that human beings began to descend, but already brought higher gifts with them from before that time. But this being is preparing to hand over the torch of this important task of being the 13th in the Mother Lodge to another individuality that we will be speaking about soon. The panel on the far left of that triptych involved uh, a, another theme, let me go back to it for a moment, is the Queen of Sheba bears the grail vessel. So Solomon is holding a ring. He wants to marry her, the Queen of Sheba, who represents the world soul. You could say she's also an emissary of the Mother Lodge. Hiram has the golden sun hammer in his hand, but she has the grail. 
and this is the grail of pre-Christian times. Well, what is that grail of pre-Christian times? This pre-Christian grail was symbolized by the phoenix. Uh, Hiram Abiff, who helped to build Solomon's temple, came from the city of Tyre in Phoenicia. The Phoenicians looked up to this phoenix. The name of their land was named after this being who had a place in their mystery tradition. In certain temples, there was, a, according to Steiner, a tabernacle where this being who was symbolized by the phoenix was uh, found an earthly habitation. And this is the being that visited those who underwent the three-day death sleep that was practiced in those days and was the awakener from the dead, was the source of overcoming that death and rising up with the wings of the soul to spiritual heights in the fire of, again, awe, wonder, reverence can be transmuted into enthusiasm the fire of the heart forces. And this being has played an important role. This is the same being that later descends into earthly incarnation as the Nathan Jesus child. This Nathan Jesus child is the sister soul of Adam that according to Rudolf Steiner's research into the Akashic record, the cosmic memory, is that this being was a part of Adam that was withdrawn after Adam succumbed to the temptation in the par paradisical story where Eve was seduced by the serpent. This is Lucifer and offering the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And this was a necessary development for human beings to move on the path towards the human ego and freedom to deal with good and evil. But there was a danger that not only the astral body would be infected with the influence of Lucifer, but also the etheric was endangered. So as a preventative measure, the gods withdrew this aspect of Adam that has to do with a part of his etheric body that has in particular to do with what's called the tone ether, the sound ether, the chemical ether, our various names, the musical ether, and the life ether, the earth ether, the meaning ether, which these are the two most mature etheric forces. Those were withdrawn. But this being who later comes as a Nathan Jesus being has those forces intact, have never participated in the fall. So what was withdrawn from Adam and Eve with the expulsion from paradise was access to the tree of life. So they had the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but the tree of life was withdrawn. And that's embodied in these higher etheric forces that have to do with the word on the one hand, uh, the tone ether, and the meaning ether has to do with thinking, thinking in the true and higher sense, 
that Rudolf Steiner spoke of in his philosophy of freedom. So this is a significant being that according to Rudolf Steiner in an esoteric lesson says, is our higher self that we need to commune with. To the degree that humanity is able to absorb knowledge of the grail in the course of its development, Rudolf Steiner says, the impulse given through the Christ event can become ever more meaningful. The inner side of Christian evolution will complement the outer more and more. What can be revealed about the higher worlds in relation to the mystery of the Christ through imagination, inspiration, and intuition will more and more permeate human thinking, feeling, and willing. The hidden knowledge of the grail will be unveiled. It will be increasingly it will increasingly pervade every expression of human life as by an inner power. So here I wanted to show the impulses that Rudolf Steiner speaks of in uh, a series of lecture or lecture called Pre-Earthly Deeds of Christ, where he says this Adam sister soul, who later incarnates as a Nathan Jesus child, was the vessel through which the Christ was able to prevent certain dangers to the development of the human physical bodily senses during the Lemurian period. And this being again served as the vessel for the Christ intervention twice within the Atlantean period, again, preventing certain dangers that would have adversely impacted human evolution. So this is the pre-Christian grail mysteries. This is the same being who's uh, symbolized in the Phoenix. But for the first time, this being fully incarnates on the physical plane at the time of the mystery of Golgotha. He had appeared before as recorded in in the Hindu culture, the Mahabharata, for example, has this Krishna being uh, in connection with Arjuna and uh, the great battle that ensues. And he's really the I am waiting to come ever further into human evolution, which the Christ being will then bring about at the turning point of time where this being actually fully incarnates onto the physical plane. As Krishna, he's still just an incorporation that's going on back then in the Bhagavad Gita, one can get a sense of this being. But the mystery of Golgotha is going to be repeated in the future. And this is then the event that we are now in the midst of in our time. The stage was set for this second coming of Christ in the etheric from the 16th century onward where materialistic thinking more and more pervaded human civilization and more and more souls crossed the threshold with these materialistic ideas. And during this period, the Christ is manifesting through an angelic being, which again is this same being that we just spoke of, the Nathan Jesus being. And 
through those souls, especially in the middle of the 19th century, crossing the threshold with these materialistic influences caused a kind of suffocation and death of this angelic being in whom the Christ was indwelling. And it was by overcoming this death that the new mystery of Golgotha on the etheric plane is unfolding. And the turning point for that unfolding was 1899, when the end of the Kali Yuga arrived. That end of the Kali Yuga was prepared by the battle in heaven between 1840 and 1879, when Michael was battling these forces that inspire those materialistic ideas that came to expression during that uh, period. And in 1879, cast down the so-called dragon, which is really the spirits of darkness, many myriads of beings who had fallen and were obscuring our vision of the spiritual world during that latter part of the Kali Yuga. But after 1899, 1900 was the beginning of the dawning out of a very dark period of a new light. And Rudolf Steiner was one of those who was there to receive this Michael impulse, which is now not the sun aspect of the logos, which came especially to the feeling life of human beings. The grail vessel can be seen as the heart on the one hand, but also the pituitary gland that's located in our head. There's kind of a figure eight between the two. One turns outward, the other turns inward. All the uh, nerves, the 12 nerves in our head coalesce around the pineal gland. And Steiner says that the pineal gland is the metamorphosed heart of our past incarnation. So it can begin to shine when we take in this Christ impulse on a level of knowledge and feeling and sacrificial deeds. And compassion is really a key that's what Parsival didn't initially have enough of to ask the question of what ails thee. So in this time, we have a new grail impulse mediated by this same being who appeared as the Nathan Jesus. But now it's the macrocosmic logos. It's the Christ creating community within human uh, beings that was inaugurated beneath the cross with this with this standing beneath the cross of Maria, Sophia, and the Johannes being unto whom he said, behold, this is your mother, behold, this is your son. So a new kind of family not based on blood was founded there beneath the cross. This was a second initiation for Lazarus who became John, the beloved disciple. And there's many secrets surrounding that Lazarus initiation that Steiner spoke of for the first time on the 28th of September. Uh, 1924, he was intending to give another part of that the following day, but was too sick. So here we deal with spiritual economy. We have seen that in the fourth or fifth centuries until the 14th century, copies of the etheric and astral bodies of Christ were bestowed upon personalities who in this way kept the spirit of Christianity alive. When such cosmic events occur, as for example, the gift of an etheric or astral body from Christ, then they are truly usually accompanied by phenomena of nature 
which we are inclined to understand as accidents, but are deeply connected to the spiritual events. To mention one, just for one example, Thomas Aquinas, as a small child, received an astral body of Christ when a bolt of lightning struck. It killed his little sister who was lying in a cradle in the same room. But it made the boy's astral body elastic in order to receive the lofty astral body of the Christ. According to historical documents, not only killed his sister, but two horses that were in a stable beneath uh, their quarters. If we take into consideration the reincarnation of Thomas Aquinas as Rudolf Steiner, we can better understand the following words shared by the late Sergei Prokofiev in his book, May Human Beings Hear It. Quote, for only when we recognize that spiritually having stood before the mystery of Golgotha, which are Rudolf Steiner's words, in an innermost earnest celebration of knowledge signified for Rudolf Steiner, a real initiation into the grail mysteries, meaning that out of the holy chalice, he received into his own eye, a replica of the Christ eye. It allows us to understand that in quite a concrete sense, he could call spiritual science, the science of the grail and that modern initiates, and in the first place, he himself can be designated as initiates of the grail. In 1913, following the foundation stone laying of the Johannes Bau, Johannes building, as the first Gertianum was called, in its forms, the thought content of the science of the grail became visible to external vision for the first time. A thorough contemplation of the forms of the Johannes Bau make it increasingly clear that the structure exhibits many features of a modern temple of the Grail. This kind of depicts that theme uh, by uh, Turgenev, who was a participant in the building of the first Gautianum. Uh, so you have the mystery of Golgotha on the right, the Gautianum on the hill on the left. You have the shining sun over the cup of the grail in the middle. So that's sort of the spiritual Gertianum. The Gertianum, according to Steiner, didn't just disappear with the flames, but it was carried into the astral world. So the Last Supper was kind of a prelude to the Passion, the 13th in the midst of the 12, and there's the one who would betray him, Judas who has to do with the Scorpio forces within the Zodiac. But the Scorpion also is related to the sign of the Eagle. So you could say Judas was a materialist, which was sort of at that time, a pioneering uh, orientation. And Steiner gives us some history as to who Judas was, his Maccabees. And there's reason to believe that he reappeared as Augustine, who was given a gift of the etheric body of the Christ. He still had his own ego and astral body. So that's part of Manichaean Christianity is to redeem evil. So here you have the human and cosmic dimension of the Holy Grail on the far right. You have the Maria in whom the Sophia being in the Johannes gospel, the John gospel, 
she's not named Mary because she had the secret esoteric name of Sophia who had incorporated into the Solomon Mary together with the Nathan Mary who had died before at during this last conversation that uh, Jesus had before going to the baptism. So at the same time that the Christ entered, the Jesus being at the baptism, the Sophia, who's the syzygy of Christ in the sphere of the Curiotities, which her being reaches up to the spirits of wisdom. That's another name for her is wisdom. She's the inspirer of philosophia and gives birth to the Christ, but is really the new Isis, the new Sophia of our time, who can also be seen in the archetypal image of the woman standing on the moon, clothed with the sun. But here she has within her arms as the moon mother, mother the spirit self represents the purified astral body. That's what she embodies, this purified astral body. That's a carryover from the old moon. The old moon is the planet of wisdom. She bears that wisdom. But now the gift of love is poured into the chalice of wisdom, into the chalice of the grail. Let us place before ourselves the mother thought of as a virgin with Christ on her lap and let us then make the statement he who can have feelings of holiness before this image he feels himself to be standing before the grail the holy chalice the moon mother now touched by Christ the new Eve bearer of Christ the Sun Spirit outshines all other lights, all other gods. So why would this be? It's because this event wasn't just a breakthrough for human beings as a gift of the gods. This was the gods themselves who had separated themselves from the earth and humanity at the time of the fall by barring access to the tree of life where the cherubim with the flaming sword guarded access. But for the first time, the gods experienced death and overcame death at this turning point of time. So there was a hallelujah among the hierarchies, as well as those who were awake to what was going on on this deeper esoteric level in the human realm. So then there's also the Easter Grail Moon, which is the macrocosmic counterpart to what the woman on the right, the Maria Sophia, is bearing. We hear later how Parsifal's name is written in that moon chalice. So here you have two of the witnesses who are beneath the cross. This is a painting by Margarita Voloshin. the birth of a new community founded upon soul spiritual kinship, which I spoke of a little earlier. Aside from the communion of souls that developed between John the Baptist and Lazarus, John, an eternal bond with the Maria Sophia was forged during this shared incarnation. Among the last words that were spoken by the Christos, the solar logos from the cross through the body of Jesus, the grail vessel. Woman, behold your son. 
and to Lazarus, John, behold your mother. And as is said in the Gospel of John, and from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. They would later live together in Ephesus. The authorship of the Gospel of St. John, which we can call the Sophian Gospel, the most esoteric of the four Gospels, and the Book of Revelation, sealed the seven seals, was thus a co-creation. This gave rise to a new esoteric stream that later came to expression in Rosicrucianism, which in turn flowed into anthroposophy. So one of the grail uh, pictures is this Roman soldier who was shaken to the core by what was going on on the hill of Golgotha. And because the Sabbath was approaching, the, the circle around the high priest sent out people to assure that these three who were hanging on the cross were dead for the Sabbath. So they were there taking hammers and breaking the bones of the thieves on either side. And Longinus used his spear out of compassion. The iron forces that live in the blood and pierced the side of Christ. And water and blood flowed forth. So he was able to show that this being in the middle had already died. And during that same period of time, when the earth was shaking, this veil of the temple was rent in twain, as the saying goes. That's the veil to the Holy of Holies that represents the future, the golden city, the new Jerusalem. So the secret of initiation that was usually hidden behind closed doors in the mystery centers was brought on to the stage of history and Longinus played a role. He said to have had cataracts in both eyes. And was healed and became a Christian. Following words by Rudolf Steiner bring to expression the cosmic dimension of the first coming, which is now being repeated on the etheric level as an event that encompasses earth and humanity. Quote, with the event of Golgotha, when the blood flowed from the wounds of the great redeemer, when the cosmic heart's blood penetrated the earth and its forces poured down as far as the center, the earth became illuminated from within and light rayed outward into the surrounding. The opportunity was then given to every single human individuality to experience this light within the self. When the earth became the body of the great sun spirit, through having been impregnated with his spirit powers, all the beings on earth were equally endowed with these forces. The seed was planted for the reunion of sun and earth. The physical body of Jesus of Nazareth was the mediator through which the powers of the cosmos were united with the earth aura. And when the blood flowed from the wounds of the body on Golgotha, the earth was taken up again into the sun power. Since then, this Christ power streams from its center into the surroundings and from the sun. Christ's power streams into the earth. One is able to experience this power, this light within oneself, 
as a human being, when one knows oneself to be a part of the earth, which as Christ's physical body is infused with his being, then the white light streams towards one from within oneself as it streams out from the center of the earth. So Lazarus or Longinus is said to have uttered, truly, this was the Son of God. Steiner indicates that the earth received its meaning through this event and that it was followed by a descent into the underworld where light was brought into the darkness that the Greeks already referred to as the realm of the shades. It'd be a better to be a beggar in the upper realm than a king in the realm of shades was a saying that was common in that period. So here we have the appearance of the resurrected one in paintings by Marie, Margarita Voloshin again and Lane, Liane Collot de Herbois. This is uh, a mystery center referred to as the Externsteine, ancient mystery center that was sacred to the Saxons. Uh, it was in the Titanberger forest. And it has a, uh, this was during the time of Charlemagne who uh, was trying to bring the Christian impulse into this region that was dominated by the old pagan culture. They had worshiped there and the Irmin soul, which represents this Tao force that was carried over from the Atlantean period was a magical power. And you could see this sarcophagus like uh, below where a neophyte was laid to go through that initiatory death. And on the right, you have an altar, which is oriented to the sun at a certain time of the year. So this was a sun mystery center uh, Rudolf Steiner speaks of it in the folk souls as a very high and important mystery center, which was overlighted by the hierarchies for long periods of time. But now it was, became a Christian mystery center. And this scene of Joseph of Arimathea and uh, Nicodemus, Nicodemus, was uh, one of the elders of the Jewish community and was nevertheless a disciple of Christ who he visited by night. He was also an initiate, a clairvoyant, but he couldn't quite understand this secret of resurrection and rebirth that Christ then spoke to him about. And these mysteries of the body were of particular importance to one of three great initiates who played a significant role around a fourth, which I speak about soon. And uh, this has to do with the mysteries of the body. So Emil Bach, was one of those who touched on this secret in his three years book, where he speaks of how Joseph Arimathea and uh, Nicodemus were really initiates who were sent to participate in this turning point of time by their teacher and initiate. Here's another rendering of that in a sketch form. The Arthurian knights, which were again under the same influence, uh, were knights of the sword. 
they were clearing the gland of mythological dragons, trying to cleanse uh, the northern regions of Europe of the dragons and battling with giants. And these are all Im imaginative battles on the astral plane. But they experienced the Christ impulse on the etheric level. They were oriented to the life spirit, uh, to the cosmic Christ. And Michael, the uh, countenance of the Christ being. The Grail Knights were knights of the word. Rudolf Steiner visited a 11th grade class that was being taught in the Waldorf School uh, by Walter Johannes Stein, who had a particular deep interest in the Grail. And he, uh, there's reason to believe he was actually the reincarnation of Trevrezent, who was the teacher of Parseval. And there are many others in the beginning of the Waldorf movement that had a deep connection to the Grail. For example, Emil Malt one time asked Rudolf Steiner why when he was out there walking through the playground, the kids would often beat him, hit him. And he said, if you would only know how you treated the Saxons uh, when you were living as Charlemagne, then you would have an idea of why they're hitting you. So anyways, uh, Charlemagne was active in the ninth century when the Grail Mysteries were unfolding on the physical plane, according to Rudolf Steiner and other authors. Walter Johannes Stein helps to illuminate this in his book on the Grail Mysteries. But it starts, the book by Wolfram von Eschenbach starts with a great castle with 12 uh, or 16 gates. And there's two armies. One is a Moorish army uh, that have to do with uh, this city of Petelamont, uh, where the queen Belacane was living. And there was uh, the leader of a white army, which is Friedebrandt, which means freedom forged in fire. They were active at eight of the gates. And then you had the Moorish army under uh, Isenhart was the leader of the black army, but he died. And he has this sort of magical armor that relates back to an earlier period. It's like a diamond uh, pop to it where the inspiration from above could still come through. And this whole story of the book, which starts with this battle and this image where uh, Parsifal's father was involved. He eventually marries the queen of Zazamak. Uh, that this represents the throat chakra, which has 16 petals. And Steiner indicated that eight of those petals in each of the chakras, half of them, are really atavistically present. They were active in the past and then closed. But if you do work on the other eight, which in this case is represented by the eight gates that the Friedrich Freedom Forged in Fire individuality is uh, actively working to enter, the other petals will awaken again to a new form of clairvoyance. So the book of Parseval by Wolfram von Eschenbach is divided into 16 chapters. And this tells you about what those 16 chapters are about. The Buddha 
gave an eightfold path that had to do with eight stages of inner development and meditative work that would awaken this throat chakra, which unlocked the mysteries of reincarnation and karma and destiny, which the Buddha penetrated as a bodhisattva. A bodhisattva is one who has an archangel that over many lifetimes penetrates deeper and deeper and deeper until he arrived at the transformative event that completed his mission under the Bodhi tree. The Bodhi tree is related to the cerebellum, which is like an inner tree. The pineal gland, pituitary gland are beneath that. These are organs that have to do with higher development. They're like the heads of the Kundalini serpent that leads to enlightenment. So there's many secrets involved in this, uh, but this has to do with forging the grail sword. The grail sword is the word sword, the larynx sword that is between head and heart. So with the lemnus gate between head and heart, when that becomes active, when the pineal gland, which is the seat of spirit self, starts to shine and the heart starts to shine with it, then the larynx becomes the bearer of the micrologos, the grail sword. As I said, Paul, Saul, who became Paul on the road to Damascus, was a forerunner of Christ in the etheric. The Christians of St. John, whose symbol was the rosy cross, this is taken from the Gospel of St. John that uh, Rudolf Steiner gave on St. John's Day in Cassell, 1909. The Christians of St. John, whose symbol was the rosy cross, said precisely that which was reborn as the mystery of humanity's higher self, this same has been preserved intact. It was preserved by that exclusive community which took its rise in Rosicrucianism. This continuity is indicated symbolically in the legend of the sacred vessel called the Holy Grail, from which Christ Jesus ate and drank, and in which the blood which flowed from his wounds was gathered by Joseph of Arimathea. This vessel, they say, was brought to Europe by angels. A temple was built for it, and the Rosicrucians became the guardians of its content, that is, of that which constituted the very essence of the reborn God. The mystery of the reborn God prevailed among men. The mystery of the Holy Grail. In the beginning was the mystery of the higher human ego. The same was preserved in the Grail and remained united, preserved therewith. In the Grail lives the ego, which is united with the eternal and the immortal, even as the lower is united with the transitory and the mortal. Whoever knows the mystery of the Holy Grail knows that from the wood of the cross springs living, budding life. The immortal self symbolized by the roses on the dark wood of the cross. Thus, the mystery of the rosy cross may be regarded as a continuation of the gospel of St. John. And in Christ who dwelt in Jesus of Nazareth, we see none but the higher divine self of all mankind the God who came down to earth in Adam and was born again. This reborn human self was continued as a sacred mystery. It was preserved under the symbol of the rosy cross and is enunciated today as the mystery of the Holy Grail and the rosy cross. So you see here how these, the rose cross, which is really a symbol of the second coming in the etheric and the grail are intimately related to each other. And that it's not just looking back to the grail, it's the call of our time to embark on the quest for the holy grail. 
This is Carl Koenig talking about knighthood for the 21st century. There is a knighthood of the 21st century where riders do not ride through the darkness of physical forces as of old, but through the forest of darkened minds. They are armed with a spiritual armor and an inner sun makes them radiant. Out of them shines healing, healing that flows from the knowledge of the human being as a spiritual being. They must create inner order, inner justice, peace, and conviction in the darkness of our time. They must learn to work side by side with angels. So I just want to quickly go through pre-Christian images of the Christ being. Here it's the Vishva Karman, the Hindu deity, the divine architect. Here it's Ahara Mazda, Ahura Mazda, the great aura of the sun that was experienced by Zarathustra, the great initiate who became the master Jesus, who became the Solomon Jesus. In the Egyptian period, we had Osiris and Isis, the divine pair. But more and more for the neophyte on the path of Christian or Egyptian initiation, uh, Osiris, who was killed uh, by Seth, was uh, no longer visible, no longer imparted his gifts. And this had to do with the fact that this being was descending to the earth as the Christ being. And so Isis became the morning Isis and the Egyptian initiates became sons of the widow. And the great pyramid at Cheops with the Sphinx was one of those mystery centers which contained a sarcophagus where the three day, three night, a uh, death-like initiation took place where one would hope that the phoenix would visit and bring about a reawakening. But there came a point where more and more neophytes were dying in the initiation chamber because the etheric body was bound ever more powerfully to the physical. These are showing how there was a great cosmic dimension to these pyramids. The very top capstone was gold. The rest was in a white uh, stone. And so when the morning sun came up, it would first touch that tip and it would shine. And in that one cornerstone, Christ is often called the chief cornerstone. This is the only building that has that kind of a chief cornerstone, the whole pyramid is embodied in one piece and it was gold to represent the sun forces. Hermes and Moses were two initiates that played an important role in preparing for the mystery of Golgotha. According to Steiner, they were both pupils of Zarathustra. He gave a copy of his astral body to Hermes and his etheric body to Moses. Moses, as a child, was rescued by the Pharaoh's daughter. And uh, he then became uh, someone who was taken in and participated in those Egyptian mysteries and would later carry them uh, into the Hebrew mystery center. So in the burning bush, He's witnessing the Christ descending into the earthly sphere. This is from an esoteric lecture where Steiner indicated that in order for a new impulse to arise out of the three first post-Atlantean ages, the ancient Indian, the ancient Persian, the Egypto-Chaldean, Babylonian, a representative of those three had to be raised from the dead 
by the Christ and that they would then become uh, central in the renewal on a higher level of those three in the future. So the representative of the third Egypto Chaldean uh, would then play a role in our fifth post Atlantean age. The Persian culture, the second post Atlantean, uh, the representative would then renew the sixth, often called the Slavic, where uh, the spirit self would unfold or in its beginnings. This is the age of Philadelphia or Aquarius. And then the ancient Indian. Uh, by the daughter of Jairus, who was raised from the dead in close connection with the healing of the woman with the issue of blood. These are all deep and significant uh, events. But the one I wanted to focus on was this Egypto-Chaldean representative, which is then representative by the youth of nine who was raised from the dead by the Christ as depicted in the Luke gospel. The, uh, the youth, the raising of nine uh, represents the carryover of the Egyptian mysteries. This individuality had previously appeared as the youth of Tsais who lifted the veil of Isis prematurely and was struck dead. This same being later, according to Steiner, incarnated as Mani or Mains between 216 and 276 AD. And that that uh, same individuality would later appear as Parseval. The place where Steiner speaks of uh, the preparation for Rosicrucianism is in the ninth chapter of uh, a book that's transcribed from lectures, East in the Light of the West. There is a fourth individuality named in history behind whom, for those who have the proper comprehension, much lies hidden, an individuality still higher and more powerful than Scythianus, than Buddha, or than Zarathustra. This individuality is Manes or Mani, and those who see more in Manichaeism than is usually the case know him to be a very high messenger of Christ. It is said that a few centuries after Christ had lived on the earth, there was held one of the greatest assemblies of the spiritual world connected with the earth that ever took place, and that there Mains gathered round him three mighty personalities of the fourth century after Christ. And in that council, a plan was agreed upon for causing all the wisdom of the bodhisattvas of the post Atlantean time to flow more and more strongly into the future of mankind. And the plan of the future evolution of civilization of the earth then decided upon was adhered to and carried over into the European mysteries of the Rose Cross. These particular mysteries have always been connected with the individualities of Scythianus, Buddha, and of Zarathustra. They were the teachers in the schools of the Rosy Cross. Hence, in all spiritual Rosicrucian schools, the deepest reverence is paid to these old initiates who preserve the primeval wisdom of Atlantis, to the reincarnated Scythianus, in whom was seen the great and honored Bodhisattva of the West. He's the one who presided over uh, these mysteries of the Arthurian knights and uh, these grail mysteries having to do with uh, the life spirit, the Christ as a cosmic uh, sun being. To the temporary incarnation or incarnated reflection of Buddha who also was honored as one of the Bodhisattva, and finally to Zarathustra, the reincarnated Zarathustra. These were 
looked up to as the great teachers of the European initiates. Such presentations must not be taken in a sense of external history, although they elucidate the historical course of events better than any external description can do. So here you just have this image of these three, Scythianos having to do with the mysteries of the physical body. That's why he's the one who sent Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, his pupils, to uh, deal with the body. So unlike the disciples who gathered around the symbolic blood in the wine at the Last Supper and the symbolic body in the bread, Nicodemus and uh, Joseph Arimathea dealt with the actual body and blood. So this is the deep level of the Grail Mysteries uh, by destiny. Joseph Arimathea had a tomb in the nearby garden adjacent to uh, Golgotha, where they laid after embalming uh, the body into the tomb, which then set the stage for Easter Saturday and Sunday. So Rudolf Steiner speaks of the two John beings, which are really uh, at the raising of Lazarus, John the Baptist was drawn in. He had been beheaded through the agency of Herodias and her daughter and Herod who had imprisoned him, but he had promised his daughter any gift that she ask for, and she asked for the head of John the Baptist. Those are the anti-grail mysteries. So Lazarus John is really two beings welded into one. One represents the able stream, a more feminine stream. The other, a more masculine stream, the Hiram Cain stream. And they then, uh, on the able side came to expression as Raphael Santi, Novalis, it goes back to John the Baptist, Elijah, and even the Adam soul. And on this other side, uh, the uh, Walter Johannes Stein adds this Balaam incarnation as prior to Hiram Abith. Then several incarnations as Christian Rosenkreutz and uh, a count to St. Germain, and this flow from two sides into anthroposophy. But there are backward Abel and Cain forces that Steiner said are the ones who are responsible for the burning of the Gertianum. They are initiates in some cases who commit the sin against the Holy Spirit. Uh, because they're acting with knowledge. The Knights Templars were also emissaries of the Grail. Uh, many of them were burned at the stake, including their Grand Master. According to indications by Steiner, Elizabeth Vrida was a reincarnation of Jacques de Molay, who was the Grand Master of the Templars. Here again, the anti Grail forces working through Philip LaBelle, and the number 666 uh, has a signature in this event. Those are the anti sun mysteries. So the Holy Grail impulse took place in the age of Raphael, who's the connected with Easter and the healing impulse. The Gertianum, we have this caduceus form, the healing staff that moves from west to east in the Gertianum. And Rudolf Steiner intended, of course, that uh, image of uh, Christ, the threefold image with Lucifer and Ariman, the sculptural group, to be 
there in the east. It's the one great thing that was not burned. In the ninth century, uh, when the grail mystery was unfolding on the earthly plane, there was at the same time in Hagia Sophia, the Eighth Ecumenical Council, where the denial of the threefold human being was reduced to the twofold, the abolition of the spirit, uh, which had various negative after effects. That building has since the Hagia Sophia devoted to the Sophia has since been converted into a mosque. But you have a middle stream that uh, where the Roman church played, you had the faith and dogma, you have the Eastern Orthodox centered in Jerusalem, uh, ritual, mystic longing. And on the left, you have the Irish esoteric stream, the grail stream, and they represent also thinking, feeling, and willing. This is from Rene Corrido in his book, The Mystery of the Holy Grail. Here's Titorel receiving uh, what was held by the angels. The old imaginative consciousness of the third age was lost. So the angels preserved it and gave it back to humanity in the fifth age as a gift when these grail impulse was meant to be renewed. And Rudolf Steiner tells us that uh, Herzleide, who uh, Gamma Ray married after he had left the uh, queen of Zazamak, uh, Belakane, and he married Herzleide, but he wasn't able to put down his anchor and once again went off uh, to serve as a warrior for the Baruch in the Islamic lands, which were very powerful at that time. It was the time of Harun al-Rashid. And uh, he ended up getting killed there. And uh, Shortly after that, uh, Arsival was born and with great travail. And his mother is called Herzleide. Herzleide is the reincarnation of Julian the Apostate, He's the Roman emperor who was seeking the sun mysteries, the old Greek uh, sun mysteries. And he was on his way to bring those back when he was killed. So he had a longing for the sun mystery. So here he had an opportunity as Herzleide to participate in them. So the wounded Amfortas also plays a big role in this. And I'm having to wind things down here. We're obviously uh, going over time. So let me just bring this to a close with Amfortas who fell prey to the lower aspect of the uh, forces of Eros. And it was the dark lord of the Castle of Wonders, which is the counterpart to the Grail Castle, where Duke Landolf II of Capua had his stronghold in that ninth century. Klingsor was caught between serving the grail and serving him. She had been Herodias in her past incarnation. So here again, you see the Manichaean redemption of evil going on. And you have the head of John the Baptist in the charger as the anti-grail. And the following statements, Steiner can provide insight into how we are predisposed to the Amfortas syndrome. Now, if we focus on the relationship of the human ego to the metabolic limb system, we find 
the origin of human egotism in this relationship. The sexual system is indeed a part of this system of human egoism, and the ego primarily penetrates the human being with egoism direct, indirectly through the sexual system. So Rudolf Steiner indicated that each one of us has both uh, amfortas, the wounded amfortas, and we need to seek the Parsival within us. And you can see here, Parsival was awakened by this image of uh, his cousin Zaguna, who had Shianatalanda, which was a prior incarnation of Rudolf Steiner. Shianatalanda died because of foolishness of uh, Parsival who had kind of gone into a tent and uh, half-naked Jeshuta was sleeping there and he took a ring and brooch after listening to advice from his mother who wanted to make him look like a fool. And Aurelis, her husband, came back, saw her all disheveled and thought that she had been unfaithful. And he went off with great anger and ran into Shinatalanda, who was protecting Parsival's lands and was killed. So he overlighted Rudolf Steiner as Shinatalanda overlighted. And here you have these incarnations that these two souls uh, lived together. And let me end with this picture of the building of the Holy Grail, willing and the physical body were given on old Saturn, feeling and the etheric on old sun, thinking and the astral on old moon. And on earth, we have the ego. And love, which is the mission of the whole earth, which is what is there in the grail vessel, arises when thinking, feeling, and willing are brought into perfect balance with each other. This is also expressed in the foundation stone meditation, which builds a bridge between the human trinity of willing, feeling, and thinking, and the divine Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in this way, we begin to contribute to the building of the future planet of love, the new Jerusalem, and unfolding the spirit self by developing the kind of compassion that Parsival eventually unfolded. And he then became the king of the Holy Grail castle and its community. I'll take one more step, the last. Beginning with the earth phase of evolution, the wisdom of the outer cosmos become an inner wisdom in the human being. Internalized in this way, it becomes the seed of love. Wisdom is the prerequisite for love. Love is the result of wisdom that has been reborn in the eye. And the woman standing on the moon, crowned with the stars, clothed with the sun, is the archetype of this transforming wisdom into love and giving birth to Christ in his second coming. Thank you uh, very much for your patience. Uh, dear Florian, thank you so much for your super intense presentation as usual. Uh, could you please stop to share your screen? Is it off now? Uh, no, it's not yet. Yeah, and uh, how do you feel? Shall we take maybe a couple of minutes of break? Sure. And let you, and let you restore your voice um, and... Uh, after the break, we will start um, 
question and answer session. Okay, let's, dear friends, let's take a couple of minutes just for a break. I mean, if you need restroom or sip of water or stretch your limbs. Yes, and then, uh, yeah, I see Dick uh, already raised his hand with questions. So please do so in chronological order. We'll take uh, one by one and um, Florian, will will answer so two minutes dear friends two minutes and we will be back Well, there's no question and answer. I got Josh and the girls coming. They're, they're arriving any minute. It's okay. okay. You can have me come out and whatever. So, dear friends, uh, lecture the lecture is recorded, so you can find it later, like in two days, on our website, or please subscribe on our YouTube channel. So, um, which will be probably also like in two days. And uh, I know content is super intense, and this is why we like Florian. So, and uh, you will be able to watch it again by maybe little pieces. I mean, I I will be do for sure. So, and then just you know, and put it together in your consciousness. Um. So, um. So you know how to raise your electronic hands, right? So it's. Um, if you put your arrow or cursor in the bottom of your screen, so you will find a button which is named uh, Reactions. If you click on it, so second button will be Raise Hands. So this is how we raise in our electronic hands. Um, Lauren, are you back? Yes. Yeah, okay. So Dick is first. Dick, uh, go. This, is a, this is a question from the previous lecture because I wasn't sure. Did you say that the Akashic records show that Christ said, I do not come to bring bring a sword between brother and brother, but come to bring peace between brother and brother? I just wasn't sure about that, so I wanted to ask that. Hmm. I don't recall that specifically, uh, but uh, the, uh, the way that uh, I'm... I know there is this uh, saying that has to do with overcoming blood relationship. So I, uh, where it says I cannot come to bring peace, but a sword uh, in that sense comes to expression in uh, one of Christ's sayings uh, where he then follows up by saying, 
unless you leave uh, father and mother and uh, brother, you can't become my disciple, something in that vein. So uh, we do have, of course, the Christ is the source of infinite love. And that's sort of the picture uh, that Steiner gives of the divinity shared uh, one aspect of its uh, attribute, wisdom with Lucifer, the other strength and power with Ariman, but this realm of infinite love is the essence of the divinity. So, but it's uh, sometimes this saying, uh, if I'm uh, thinking correctly, uh, about the one you're referring to has to do with this rising above blood relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Creating a new kind of community not based on blood. Okay. Um, so, Dick, are you good? Thank you. All right, Cameron. Yes, thank you so much for the, the conversation talk today. My question is related to um, some uh, Rudolf Steiner's initiation in Austria. Uh, I read a little bit about his autobiography. He didn't mention too much about that initiation. Do you have any other information about that that you could share? He did share with uh, Riddlemeyer uh, that he had two uh, spiritual teachers. He also in what's called the Bar Document, which was uh, shared with Edward Chure, uh, who was living in Alsace, uh, I believe not too far from Dornach. He went to visit him and he asked him certain questions uh, as part of a biographical sketch. And it's included in uh, some forewords to certain lectures that Steiner gave. And one of it was that uh, there was an individual who appeared as a herb gatherer. Uh, this was already, I think, when Rudolf Steiner was like 18 years old and was traveling to school. He would meet this er herb gatherer. And this was a very knowledgeable uh, person uh, about esoteric lore as well. Yeah, Felix Skagutsky. Skagutsky. Emil Bach did research and helped to identify who he was. He, you can see from his features, he's a very strong willed uh, person. And Rudolf Steiner indicated that he was the emissary of Christian Rosenkreuz. Christian Rosenkreuz worked through him. And when Rudolf Steiner started to ask certain questions, that uh, Felix couldn't quite answer, he uh, introduced him to another individual who Steiner refers to as a second master. But we don't have uh, the identity of that particular person. But he uh, told him to study certain philosophical works like Fichte, for example. Rudolf Steiner had already been uh, studying in that direction. And he uh, told them, I've, I've uh, told you who you are. You need to take the bull of public opinion by the horns and you need to enter the skin of the dragon which Rudolf Steiner did by going to a technical school and learning about science and technology. He was really entering into the skin of the dragon. But this, he indicated mm -hmm. to Riddlemeyer that behind this individuality was the Master Jesus. The Master Jesus is the uh, individuality who together with Christian Rosenkreuz play a central role in the Western esotericism that Rudolf Steiner worked with. And they generally incarnate at least once every hundred years and they work in close collaboration. And that uh, the uh, uh, 
Christian Rosenkreutz is now more in the foreground. The old Christian initiation uh, harkens back to the Master Jesus who had been Zarathustra and incarnated as the Solomon Jesus. So you have sort of a lineage there uh, of these things. And Rudolf Steiner uh, spoke of how he was in touch with these uh, beings on the soul spiritual plane. He didn't need to, after a certain point, meet them physically anymore and was in a kind of communion uh, with them. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, so, dear friends, more questions? Okay, so I think it's a good time to conclude our uh, session, our meeting. Yeah, and uh, dear Eugene, so you are here. As soon as you're here, can you, can you give us a little intro for your next presentations, which will happen next Saturday, if you want to. You're still muted. And un unmute, unmute. Eugene, unmute yourself. All right, oh, yeah. thank you now very you, much. Now you can Maria. start, now you can start, yes. All okay. right. <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, to next week, if you come, you will hear a little bit uh, about the grail again, but from a completely different perspective and how it relates to um, Waldorf education and Steiner's intentions for Waldorf education and how this aspect of it, uh, what I call the reverse grail ritual in the Waldorf school is becoming of ever greater importance um, over the 14 year period of 2019 to 2033. And that this will be um, very determinative of the future of Waldorf education. And since it stands as the oldest and largest of the daughter movements, it will have its effect on the daughter movements as well. So we'll be looking a little bit at how does Waldorf education work in the relationship, not only of the teacher and the child, but also the relationship of the teacher, the child, and the spiritual beings who populate the Waldorf school as much as the children do. And We'll look at the forces that are arrayed right now. The um, uh, subtitle of the lecture is Waldorf at War. And it's interesting, of so many of the images that Florian showed us, we're of warriors, you know, certainly Parseval, um, but also uh, we see the many times that figures involved with spiritual work are depicted in armor. And um, does the Waldorf school have the fortification? Do the Waldorf teachers have the armor that they need to battle with the opposition forces, which um, will uh, be working very, very strongly year by year in the years to come. So, um, it's a little bit of a continuation, actually, what Florian has brought, though, what a tremendous foundation he's given, and I'll be a little bit more specialized and specific. How will Waldorf education go forward to the year 2033? Okay. okay. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Thank you, Eugen. Um, Dear Florian, thank you again for your wonderful Easter lecture. And dear friends, very warm uh, Easter greeting to you all from us and um, looking forward to meet you again online. Thank you, thank you so much. Please unmute your machine and say thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Florian. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Florian. Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andre, for uh, your facilitating this. Well, very welcome for you all. <laughs> Dear friend, good night and uh, good afternoon. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night.